Good afternoon, everyone, and a blessed Ramadan al Mubarak for all those fasting. CJM is so excited about this series of primers on sustainability. After our first session on Sustainability 101 by Razif Yusuf and Sharif James from Saim Dhabi, we then had BK Sinha, who was really on fire, talking about converting waste to wealth. And then last week was Energy Efficiency with Tinchi Izaini Abdul Wahab from MESCO, who walked us through how we can manage this critical resource blowing our minds. And today, water, which we most certainly can't live without. Whom else but Heineken? who has not only set aggressive water efficiency targets, but has gone beyond that and actually conserved 289% of what they have actually used in their products through the adoption and rehabilitation of rivers. For our moderator today, Kusu Chong is not able to join us, but we have Dr. Gary Becerra, who is a CGM council member. It is with great pleasure, I now pass the floor to our moderator, Dr. Gary. Thank you so much, uh, Datin Sri Sunita. And uh, along with uh, Datin Sri, allow me to welcome everyone this afternoon to the uh, CGM learning series, How to Start Your Sustainability Journey. As Datin Sri has already mentioned, this is the fourth in a series of uh, seven uh, sessions. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, honored and, and very pleased to be able to uh, be given the opportunity to moderate this uh, session. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, it goes without saying if, if, if we uh, saw the video earlier, I, I had some notes, but, but everything I, I wanted to say has already been said by the videos. Uh, and, and we should really use the time to get to our very, very uh, distinguished and, and informed uh, facilitators. Now, um, as mentioned, uh, we have uh, very pleased to have uh, Mr. Roland Bala, who is the managing director of Heineken Malaysia, Berhad. Uh, just a few words about him. He started his career with British Petroleum or BP, where he spent 16 years working in sales, logistics, operations, and planning roles in, in retail, uh, gas, and, and lubrication business. He was appointed general manager for BP Vietnam up to 2005, before then heading the uh, lubrication business for Malaysia and Singapore from 2005 to 2007. Uh, then Mr. Roland joined Asia Pacific Breweries in 2008 as a special assistant to the regional director, and in 2009 was appointed general manager for Da Nang and Phang Nam breweries in Vietnam. From 2012 to 2018, uh, Roland was managing director of Cambodia Brewery Limited, which is Heineken's operating company in Cambodia, where he led the company to double its market share and become the market leader in the country. And since September of 2018, Roland took on his present role with Heineken Malaysia, becoming the company's first Malaysian managing director in its history. So uh, incidentally, Roland is also a member of the governing council of Confederation of Malaysian Brewers, Berhad. And with that, I'd like to welcome Mr. Roland Bala and uh, have him uh, begin his presentation and in the process also share uh, and introduce the, the other members of his uh, team who will be co-presenting with him. Mr. Roland, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Gary, and uh, also to Datin Sri Sunita and all the team at the Climate Governance for, for the very warm introduction. <laughs> Very colorful introductions, let's put it that way. Uh, but I think most important is I, I like to thank uh, each and every one of you for dialing in. Uh, it, it shows uh, you know, the, your curiosity, the fact that you are dialing in it already speaks a lot about your intent to join us on this journey of uh, raising the bar on sustainability. And um, yeah, on this note, uh, I like to give a, uh, you know, uh, uh, and our college to uh, the climate governance of Malaysia uh, for raising the bar, raising the awareness on uh, sustainability and giving it a sense of uh, urgency as well. Uh, for us at Heineken, um, <clears throat> why we pick this subject uh, is simply because uh, I think not many of you know, 95% uh, of the product that we have, the beer and style that we have is in fact uh, made up of water. Um, 
anyhow, I'll be joined by two of my colleagues. Uh, that's uh, firstly, I'd like to introduce Renuka Indra Raja, who's our corporate affairs director, and uh, who has been doing a lot of work on um, our water management uh, all this while. Yeah. And also, I'd like to introduce another colleague of mine. Uh, Salima Bakova. Salima, where are you in the crowd? Salima is our supply chain director. Um, yeah, as you can imagine. So she's the one who's really driving a lot on water efficiency for the company. Uh, she will pop up uh, shortly. I think uh, there's always these technical glitches that we go through whenever we do this. In fact, it'd be very nice to do it. Uh, in I'm here. I'm here. Roland, I'm around. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure you, you, you'll appear at some point. Um, okay, I think uh, before we go ahead, you know, I know that everyone is excited to see what we have to share. Uh, it's really all about, I know that some of you actually have done a probably even better job than what we have done in water management. Let's put it that way. All right. Uh, however, why we are doing this is uh, simply in the spirit of sharing in the spirit of really caring for our environment. I'm a Malaysian too. I want a nice Malaysia, right? Um, and also in the spirit of for us to learn from each and every one of you. So I would uh, really encourage everyone to participate actively, um, even through the chat book, chat uh, box letter, all right? Um, but before we get into, you know, into all the downloads, uh, great if, you know, if we just pause for a moment, right? Uh, think if the government tell us, tell us today that they will shut the water supply to, you know, to your business. You will not have water supply for the next one week. Imagine what's the implication of all this to you. We have seen one day, two days of shutdown. What if they say one week, you're not going to have water. You know, I think for us, <laughs> it's it's a very tough one, right? Okay, with that with that as a background in terms of uh, to set our thinking, right? Uh, I will then take you to the next slides. Hmm. I mean, if you look at this, uh, the world will face forty percent shortfall in fresh water supply within 10 years. That's not long at all. That's, you know, by 2032. What this means is it's a real and present danger to human race. Yeah. And there is a sense of urgency here that we need to act and we need to act very fast. <clears throat> Next slide. Bring it closer to, let's try to personalize this, all right? Um, I don't know if anyone knows how much water we use in a day, you know, when you start in the morning, you shower and all that breakfast and um, quite a lot of things involving water, right? Um, and even doctor tell us we must drink so much water as well. <laughs> um, do, do you know how much uh, water we use here in Malaysia in a day? Okay, let's, let's look at the data. What does the data tell us? Yeah, here in Malaysia, we actually use 209 liters uh, averagely per person in a day. That's equivalent to one of those, you know, one of those uh, drum, close to 209 liter drum. And if you look at this, the recommendation is 165. Uh, if you look at Singapore, super efficient, 158. They recycle a lot of things, right? Here in Malaysia, we just use it one time off and that's it. Um, so there's still a lot that we as Malaysian can do to help ourselves, put that way. Next. Um, if you look at this uh, chart here, you know, um, red mean where there is water stress. And Malaysia is actually in the yellows, right? So which means to say that we are in the low to medium water risk. But that is despite the fact that Malaysia is actually ranked number seven in terms of uh, precipitations. 
amount of waterfall that we receive in the world, right? Uh, in a year. So there is still a lot more that Malaysian can do. Why is it that we are actually in the low to medium water risk, for instance? Huh? Um, and if you look at a lot of global uh, data, for instance, there's easily about uh, 2 billion of, or 25 percent of the world populations are living in water stress areas. And uh, that figure is expected to increase to 5 billion by 2050. Today, the world population is uh, 7.9 billion around there. Yeah, by, two, by 2050, you're looking at 5 billion people will be in water stress areas. Next slide. And here in Malaysia, what they're saying is that, uh, you know, um, the water stress areas in Malaysia is expected to uh, is expected to triple, uh, to go threefold by 2030. That's only um, eight years, uh, eight years down the stretch. And this is uh, work done by Big Nagara in collaborations with uh, this this project here that you can see on the screen. So it's again it speaks a lot about how eminent this issue is facing our country. Next, uh, if you look at where are the main causes uh, and what are the consequences, for instance, it's uh, all about growing demand. Uh, and uh, globally, we have tripled the amount of water that we draw in the past 50 years. And this is expected to grow to 55% uh, percent more by 2050, for instance. Yeah. And uh, the picture at the bottom here, if you look at this, uh, there's 80% of wastewater um, globally have been discharged without any treatment. Uh, can you imagine, I mean, if you're Mother Nature, how do you feel with all this uh, uh, wastewater being thrown at you? How much more work can you do to recover, for instance? So there is serious pollution that we have, and there is a ser serious uh, imbalance in terms of the growing demand that we have which then has an impact on uh, you know, the biodiversity, loss of water sources, and also climate change. Uh, here in Malaysia, we, we experienced that. I mean, the most recent one, the huge flood that we have in December, for instance, uh, and that was something that uh, unprecedented for such a long time, and the inconvenience it caused to a lot of the businesses as well, and communities as well. Yeah. Um, next. Okay, I, I'm sure quite a lot of you who work for multinational uh, organization, uh, for instance, even some of the very big conglomerates that we have here in uh, Malaysia, you subscribe to this United Nations uh, Sustainable Goal. There's uh, 17 goals that has been uh, laid out uh, for, for us to work on, for instance. And uh, one of them is actually um, the uh, sustainability, sustainability goal. Uh, on water management and sanitation, that is a uh, SDG number six, they call it. Yeah, and uh, clearly uh, the latest report from the United Nations is that our world is uh, not on track. Yeah, we are way off uh, against achieving this uh, goal number six, and uh, we need to accelerate the actions to close the gaps. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Next. Um, what there is to business, uh, I think, um, you know, like what I said just now, just reflect for a moment, if there is no water, for instance, what's the impact to the business? And if you look at it, yeah, it's a case of a uh, few things that we're looking at. One is, uh, of course, even for the business itself, I think there's a re reputational risk that you face. We, I spoke about pollution is one of the biggest uh, cause of uh, water scarcities, for instance. And in some cases, we either have too much water uh, or the water is simply not fit for use. Um, and also regulations, are we putting enough to ensure that uh, we enforce and we police the, uh, you know, how, how the society uh, treat the water resource, for instance. Um, for us, at, and Heineken, for example, you know, I think uh, before we invest into any brewery, we must have the assurance that there is enough water supply for the next 10, 
at least during the business case of um, the investment. Yeah. So it's a serious one. I, I still remember when I was in Vietnam. So I have to approach the people's committee to say that we can bring this money to the country, but are you able to supply us those water? And I, I was uh, pleasantly surprised by how fast the country responded. The entire people's committee responded in terms of uh, ensuring that we will have enough water supply, especially in water stress uh, areas like Da Nang, for instance, central Vietnam. They do face uh, quite, a, quite a big uh, issue in the water supply there. Uh, for you, let's just take a quick pool. Uh, how important is water to your business, for instance? I know those in a food and beverage business, for instance, you know, you, you just simply can't have, uh, you just can't serve anything if there is no water, for instance. Or those in the agriculture business, for instance. Yeah. So if you can just take a moment just to quickly uh, participate in this and just submit the answer, and then afterwards we probably can see. Uh, how do we rank this? <clears throat> okay, so we move on and uh, do we have the result? Only one answer so far. Business critical, very important, somewhat important. Okay, at least half are saying that it is uh, uh, very important. Um, yeah, we do have people who say it's not very important. I wonder what kind of business is that. Uh, perhaps later on we can chat a bit. Uh, okay, thanks, thanks for your very quick response. Uh, can we move on to the next? Yeah, as you can see from all these headlines, you know, water cut in 463 areas in Glen Valley due to pollution, water disruption, Billions of uh, ringgit in losses from uh, Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers, for instance. I just alluded to you just now for Heineken, for instance. We must have the assurance that there is enough supply of water for that particular site before we put in these uh, hundreds of millions of euro on investment, for instance. Uh, if you look at the other one here, uh, which we just suffered, uh, something that I mentioned earlier on the flood that we just had, we could use those 6.5 billion money on medicine, you know, education, and a lot of infrastructure work that are helping to drive our economy. But instead, we're using this to mitigate, uh, to help people during time of disaster, which should not happen. So the point here is the impact are real to not only society, but also to business. <clears throat> Next, please. Uh, yeah, few few point here. If if you look at Ayaslango uh, report, there are 90 cases of plant shut down due to raw water pollution, and this uh, is about 10,405 million liters uh, per year. If you actually convert that based on uh, you know 200 liters, the one percent years, I think it worked roughly to about one and a half day of uh, water cut for you know the 30 over million populations that we have in the country. Yeah, one and a half day of no water. Um, second point that I would like to make here is, you know, if you look at all this, it's all about pollution. The second one here is also about uh, pollution. This is also pollution, palm oil spillage, also pollution. It's pollution, it's all pollution. So again, uh, like what uh, my colleague panelist uh, BK Sinha mentioned during the West, what, Waste management uh, says that he was really on fire talking about it. Uh, firstly, please take care of your waste. Yeah. So I think if we actually take care of all the waste, we would have uh, mitigated a lot of these, uh, let's say, man-made disasters that happened during that time. Um, can we move to next? Okay. If you look at here in Malaysia, 97% of our raw water supply actually come from rivers, right? But unfortunately, one third of our rivers are totally polluted. But given all that background, we, we have hope. Yeah. Uh, that's why I like to bring up this, uh, you know, this story around uh, Cheung, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, Cheung Yichion uh, Stream in uh, Korea. This is a real success story. I think you can Google it, you can look at it in the YouTube. 
there are a few important points that I like, I like to make here. One of them is this uh, man-made uh, sort of uh, improved waterways, rehabilitated river uh, that has been done. In fact, it helped to, uh, as a flood protection uh, measures uh, for the next 200 years because uh, it sustained the flow rate, it regulated the flow rate of uh, any potential flood in, um, uh, in the city. And second is also, it increased uh, biodiversity by something like 639% of uh, plants, you know, birds and uh, animals. Um, and there are a few more here. It reduced urban heat by three degrees to six degrees uh, C. Imagine we have this running in Kuala Lumpur, you know, um, and reduced air pollution as well by 35%. Um, and it attracts something like 64,000 uh, visitors every year. And next slide, please. Uh, Hanikan, uh, our focus is really on protecting our water resource. And this is actually guided by our global uh, Brew a Better World uh, strategy. As you can see here, one looking at the environment, which we talk about, uh, very skewed toward water. And the other one is on social responsibility. And uh, of course, responsible consumption as well. Um, on this note, I will then pass it to my colleague uh, Renuka and Salima later to take us through on what we have done and something that we can share with all of you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roland. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Just like to share the story with you on how we embarked on the journey to take care of uh, rivers and water. If you see this photo on the right hand side. This is the stream which runs behind our brewery. Uh, we embarked on this journey in 2007 because at that point we reflected that the key ingredient to our products is water. 95% of beer is water and great beer requires high quality water. With that in mind, uh, we decided to start our, at our very own backyard, Sungai Wei. When we started in 2007, the river was generally pink in color because it was littered completely with pink plastic bags. The local communities were actually using the river as a dumpster. So we had to engage local communities, look at working with NGOs, with local councils, with the various government departments who take care of rivers, bring them all together in a steering committee, work hand in hand, um, that took a year and a half to make that breakthrough. It was a long, arduous journey, but well worth it. Um, we installed infrastructure such as rubbish traps. We created rock beds, as you see in that photo, so that plant life could thrive. And the most important thing that we had to do was change the mindset of local communities, yeah, to get them to understand that rivers are a very important source of water. So in 2012, we're very proud to say that we could actually reintroduce fish into a river, which previously was a completely dead river. So today, Sungai Wei remains our model uh, to showcase to communities at large what can be done with your backyard, uh, rivers in your backyard, yeah? I'll then move on to the next slide. Um, Heineken is a company more than a decade ago um, started driving initiatives to reduce water consumption given the importance of water. And um, they uh, recently developed this um, pyramid, water pyramid, three-pronged approach to dealing with water and, and, and safeguarding our resource. Water circularity, water circularity is all about treating our wastewater, uh, making sure that 100% of water gets treated before it's released back into the river. And very proud to say at Heineken Malaysia Berhad, um, we not only meet, but we exceed the standards set by the Department of um, Environment. Yeah. Also looking at ways to reuse and recycle water. Um, more of this will be touched upon by my colleague Salima. And then we look at water efficiency. Heineken globally has reduced one third of our water consumption over the last decade and continues to have very audacious goals in this area. Again, Salima will elaborate on that. Water stewardship, I'd like to talk to you about the work we've done to take care of our watershed. Yeah, our watershed is where we actually draw water, the source of our water for our production. Yeah. 
So we've been doing various initiatives over the years. We fully balance uh, the water we use, as Dr. Sunita mentioned at the beginning of the session. We are actually 289% water balance, which means for every one liter of water, which we use in production, we return 1.5 liters back into, uh, we replenish that back into the environment. Yeah, that is what it means to be water balanced. We are 289% water balanced. How have we done this? Apart from taking care of the river, which I spoke about, we've also installed about 22 rainwater harvesting systems. Uh, we've built a 305 meter clay dike in Raja Musa. What this clay dike does, it helps to preserve water in the water basin, but it also helps to prevent forest fires, yeah? And in the same area of Raja Musa, we've rehabilitated, we reforested two hectares of, our, uh, of uh, mangrove swamp. Yeah. So these are some of the initiatives uh, which we, we've um, implemented over the years. Happy to share more if anyone wants to reach out. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll now need to pass on to Salima. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Beer production is very specific, and uh, I was trying to find some solutions which will be applicable for any business. And uh, in order to start your journey with uh, water efficiency, you have to mm, you have to start with yourself. Yeah, so uh, it's obvious, but we have to start with ourselves, and we have to start influencing others afterwards. Uh, in uh, and ask yourself, how often do you analyze your water bill? How Often do you uh, track it versus previous month? Do you understand the difference between the month? Do you know the reasons why one month you uh, consume more than the other month? That's very important to track how do you use your water. The other step which is uh, critically important for water efficiency is restoration of basic conditions. If you have some losses, if you have some leakages, if you have some opportunities to reduce, you have to understand that you have these opportunities. You have to uh, fix them. And uh, of course, afterwards, you can start looking into the good practices. I just placed two practices here, uh, which could be used by any of uh, you. Uh, you. We have more than, we have 250, 250 participants, more than 250 participants. And each, if every one of us will start using some good practices, I think that that will influence others as well. And if you are running the business, in order to engage your employees, uh, it's good to cascade some of the indicators to the uh, employees level and uh, maybe or even including their uh, short-term in incentives. Uh, so good practices of the industry could be various. And uh, in our in brewing industry, we are using um, mm, actually uh, plenty of good practices because Heineken is a company with a, a huge history and we have uh, many breweries around the world that are sharing these practices. Uh, if you are interested in some of the practices related to the industry, we, uh, you can also contact me. Uh, I'm open for to share. And um, engage your people to, to uh, look into the innovative ideas. Uh, world is not, uh, world is changing very fast. And there are so many ideas in place and you can see them in a, a, even on a photo. Uh, so I know that uh, dishwashing machine is not really very popular in, in Malaysia, but if you see the difference and if you have a small business running, uh, so maybe that's a good solution for you. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, in order to, um, uh, to, to make sure that your uh, actions, your activities bring some results, you have to validate them and test them. And again, evaluate the impact and compare your bills, compare your consumption. So the, having, uh, it was mentioned a few times that uh, beer is uh, mainly consists of water. And if you check any of the label or can, uh, the main ingredient on label on a can will be water. And we feel ourselves very much responsible to uh, continue, continue the journey uh, towards water efficiency and in, in, in decrease the consumption per hectolitre of produced beer. Uh, having said that, I want to move to the next slide and I uh, want to mention that 95% uh, of beer uh, is, is water, but only 30% of water that we consume goes to the fin finished product. The rest is uh, water that we use for cleaning and disinfection. 
And that, of course, creates a lot of pressure on us, uh, on uh, business, uh, to make sure that our wastewater uh, treatment is efficient and uh, reliable. So uh, when we have any new um, chemical, new um, cleaning material, uh, we have to make sure that this cleaning material is not affecting negatively on our wastewater treatment. That's really important to have good management of change procedure if you are, uh, if you are in, this, uh, in a similar business. So uh, we have uh, our utility zone uh, technicians are uh, trained to monitor all the uh, parameters of our wastewater treatment plan, and they do it on a daily basis. Uh, our wastewater, the final discharge water could be used for gardening. Uh, and um, yeah, so we, uh, at the moment uh, we are not ideal. Yeah, so I have to uh, admit that we are not ideal. We do not use all of the opportunities yet, uh, but we continue this journey. And uh, mm, uh, the other project that we plan is uh, uh, rainwater harvesting. And we will introduce this uh, rainwater harvesting this year uh, uh, based on our expansion project. Um, yeah, so um, one more point to, to mention is that uh, your uh, opportunities for reuse of cir so circular water, are there are a lot of opportunities. Please uh, think about this differently yeah? and, and start um, um, uh, bringing these new ideas into the wastewater uh, treatment uh, procedures as well. At the moment, uh, we are, uh, yeah, so it's also very important to uh, liaise, to, to be in contact with the DOE and if any non-compliance, uh, proactively report and any issues that you have also proactively report to DOE and find a solution together. Yeah. That's it from my end. Okay, many, many thanks, Alima and Ranuka, as you could see that uh, yeah, we're also driving the diversity agenda as well. I'm outnumbered by a few ladies here. <laughs> in fact, we have 50, 50 ladies and men in the company at the moment. Uh, now we move to the next one. Uh, we have a video to show you. Yeah. Okay, next. I know that you all have a lot of questions, uh, probably how to start your sustainability, uh, water sustainability journey. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. I.R. Lim Chao Hock, who is uh, the chairperson for MyCDNet. And also uh, he, he sits uh, on our Heineken uh, Corporate Responsibility uh, Foundation as well. Uh, so this, uh, some of the things that he has been doing. So probably perhaps uh, uh, Lim Chow, you could appear for the camera. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Roland, uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, but good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lim. And as what uh, Roland mentioned, I'm the chairperson for CS CSO, known as the Malaysian Capacity Development Network for sustainable water management, or in short, my CDNet. And first of course, I must thank uh, both uh, uh, CGI and also the Hennigan for allowing me to uh, say a few words about what we are and who we are. Basically, we are uh, CSO committed towards uh, what we call the water uh, management from a capacity development point of view. In short, 
we deal with, thing with things like education, the public outreach programs, and so on and so forth. But essentially, our mission is to promote, facilitate, capacity development for the purpose of sustainable water management in Malaysia. And we do this through the provisions and support of programs that foster outreach, training, education, research, and development. We cover all aspects of water in terms of water resources, in terms of water as a utility, both water supply as well as sanitation. Uh, we also talk about more importantly as what I think uh, the previous speakers, Mr. Roland, uh, Renuka, and also the Salima has mentioned about in terms of the so-called the water, the so-called demand management, as well as also the pollution control in rivers as well. Huh? So anything touch on water, we're here to provide all necessary training, so-called, uh, we call it the capacity development as well. We do it in a way mainly through what we call training of trainers, all right? And uh, we also conduct a lot of outreach programs as well, technical talks and this as well. Uh, you can see on my uh, this slide here, I have a website uh, uh, written there. Do come and join us. It's a it's all we have to a global network known as CAMNET under UNDP. And our mission is to provide training or all kind of capacity development free. And we I certainly invite all of you uh, as a individuals to be a member of my CDNet. Membership is free of charge, and the benefit is that uh, you will provide honest training in terms of water management, both as a corporate sector as well as to individuals to be a good citizen in terms of water management. And suddenly, I think uh, like Anakin has done, uh, they have actually they have done a great job in terms of so-called, not just water saving, but even in terms of catchment uh, and management as well. And I must mention that not just my way, they have done a lot of other streamers to Malaysia as well. Huh? So certainly, I invite all of you to join us. Membership is free of charge. It can come in as both corporate as well as individual members. And certainly, we provide, we can provide you all the necessary training and perhaps even join us to be a steward or even the partners in caring for the rivers in particular. Huh? All right. So, I think uh, you can get all the, even download all the materials free of charge in the, from our website itself. And uh, as I mentioned, do enjoy certainly a lot of things to be gained from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lim. I think we are getting to the end of the presentations. Um, you know, um, for for us, the I I saw quite a lot of questions in the chat group and all that. We'll get to that afterward. But before that, um, there should be some call for actions. Uh, um, tell us in the chat uh, what you commit to do to protect water resource in your business. Say with us. Uh, maybe we also can learn from from you as well. I think uh, we will look at uh, what is pragmatic and uh, the impact uh, this has. Uh, please leave your name and your contact because we do have uh, some some incentive as well, right? Uh, uh, for the for the for the non-Muslim and uh, those uh, above legal drinking age, uh, you will have an unforgettable experience at our Heineken Brewery in uh, you know in uh, Sungai Way uh, for the fun. For, Muslim colleague, we will give you a shopping voucher for the Raya. Okay, so we give a incentive for the top five participants. <laughs> yeah, it will be judged by the panel. Right, we will not announce it today, but we'll let you know. Over to you, Dr. Gary. Thank you so much, uh, Roland, also Renuka, Salima, and Dato Lim. Uh, for a very engaging uh, presentation, very illuminating presentation uh, on uh, how you at Heineken are managing your water uh, resources and protecting and indeed protecting it and uh, multiplying, growing uh, your water resources. Uh, also like to, to, to thank the more than 250 participants who, who are actually following uh, this uh, presentation today and, and these sessions. We, we hope to, to have you uh, uh, use your questions. If you have any in the uh, question and answer box, Q&A box, we already have quite a number of questions. Thank you very much for those. Um, also uh, note that uh, in the chat box, you will find the link to uh, uh, the, the recording of this event in case you do want to record it. Um, let's get very quickly into the questions then if I can. Uh, Sean Yao, uh, Sean, sorry, Sean Yang, uh, Aoyang has asked a question regarding the, the four areas you talked about, demand, pollution, loss of biodiversity, as well as climate change. And I asked a bit of a difficult question, which, which is the most urgent effect 
in Malaysia, and I, I guess you could answer this in the context of, of your experience uh, as, as a, a water using a business. Would you like to handle that? Uh, Roland, yes? Um, yeah, for sure. I think uh, a lot of this uh, common sense, and I think if you just look at the slides that we presented just now, uh, a lot of the causes of our problem come from pollution. Uh, again, I like to allude to what uh, you know, BK, BK Sinha mentioned earlier on, look after your waste, <laughs> right? That's the first thing that we do. And of course, the second thing is really about uh, how do we, do we minimize uh, the use of water, for instance, like what Salima mentioned, start with your water bills. Do we really try, consciously try to reduce the water usage, for instance? Uh, so these are the few things, first and foremost. <laughs> Anything to add, Dr. Lim? Yes, perhaps I can just add, uh, suddenly I echo what uh, Mr. Roland mentioned. Look, you know, in, in, in the, the studies that we carry out, the most important, the uh, pertinent problem then in terms of priorities actually uh, in a way, in terms of uh, to, to, to keep our river clean, another water quality is the most important aspect. Uh, about 3,000 3, millimeter of rainfall annual average, uh, which means that in short, we do have abundant rainfall. But then, what's the use of where water is dirty in the river where it's spread so much water? 97% is what Renoka mentioned, depend on the water, 97% of water from the river. But what's the use if the water is dirty? The treatment cost is not this high, but sometimes it's even untreatable as well in terms of toxic uh, material, in terms of effluent discharge from the factory industry as well. Uh. So I think as one Ron mentioned, uh, the most important thing is that I think do no harm. And what is the harm? The river, I think that's the most important. Then they, I think what was talked in terms of, uh, we call it the, the important point, the principle behind is the uh, pollution has to be controlled as and it doesn't mean another one at our own the factory, our own thing, so called yard, even in, in terms of even the let's say even our home itself. All right, all of this pollution need to be in the way. But, oh. So, this obviously, make sure you throw rubbish or you know, a proper manner. Affluence, in terms of so called waste discharge from the factories, by all means, treat it first before you actually discharge into the river. All right, and I think this is the most important part do no harm to the rivers. Thank you. Yeah. Before I, before I let you go, Dr. Lim, there's a question from Mr. Uh, Mugandran Subramaniam. Uh, any, any questions as, as to whether this release of uh, affluence and discharge uh, is actually uh, due to cost factors? Now, I know this is a very short-sighted um, uh, uh, approach, I guess, uh, but in, in, you know, how, would you, how would you raise the issue of discussing the costs of treating and, and releasing uh, effluents that, that are actually uh, 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 within the, the standards for, for the environment as opposed to, to always pointing at, at cost as a factor. How would you respond to that? Thanks. Certainly, thank you very much for the in interesting questions. Obviously, I think to many of the industries and so the manufacturers, to them, obviously treating and the uh, water at cost at their own premises is certainly a cost. Mm -hmm. and, I think uh, more important is that uh, you must also realize that in terms of the corporate responsibility, that uh, what actually thrown out uh, in terms of affluent into, into the river finally got to affect uh, the so-called uh, supply of water in terms of water water supply for the for the, for the Raya. And I think uh, I would say that uh, uh, it's also a requirement, actually, a requirement are in the regulations under the Department of Environment that uh, affluent that come from the factories need to be treated versus it. So certainly, I think... Uh, uh, factory need to not just comply, but I think more important is treat the social responsibility that need to throw or so treat the, treat the so called problem first before it can be charged into the river. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. if, if for me, I probably just want to add, you know, I think uh, reputation is very important. I think uh, a lot of you, even Heineken as a company, started 150 years ago, it started just a small business as well. But I think uh, taking those responsibilities, building your reputation as a corporation over the longer term, I think it's something that I'm sure you all don't want to gamble, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. For anything else to add, Renuka or Salima? No, okay.
Um, let's move along then. I, I know that there's a great deal of interest in the uh, rehabilitation uh, effort of uh, Sungai Wei, and we'll get to that, that those questions in a little bit. Uh, just a technical question first from uh, Roslan Mohammed Ashraf. How much does rainwater harvesting, or how much is rainwater harvesting expected to contribute to Heineken's water saving initiative? And what are some of the challenges uh, uh, that you faced with uh, rainwater harvesting? Would you like to, to handle that, Roland? Uh, perhaps uh, Salima is more technical. Salima, okay. Yeah, I'll take this question actually. So uh, it is included in our uh, one of the expansion phases. So we're going to introduce it this year. There was also a question regarding the investments. I yes. can tell you that it could be absolutely various because you can use even the plastic tanks or even mm -hmm. IBC tanks for this, for water harvesting. It depends on the size of the business and the purpose that you're going to use, uh, how you're going to reuse this water. Uh, in our case, uh, the investments are included in a bigger project. So I, I don't remember so exactly how much was the rainwater, but if you contact me uh, directly, uh, I, I'll find out this. Uh, re regarding the challenges, uh, there is no challenge at all. It is very simple exercise to introduce water harvesting. Uh, of course, if you are going to treat this water further on the next step, that will require some uh, some investments and maybe uh, some um, yeah additional steps to, to treat that water. Again, depends on a on a end uh, on a purpose of this uh, treatment. But uh, it, the project itself is very simple. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Salima. Um, we have a question um, on. Uh, the I guess I guess it, it would be one that, that I could I could I could pose to everyone. Um, based on research, Malaysia is categorized by, from Francis Poe, by the way. Malaysia is categorized as a low medium risk for water. Is the risk distribution more acute in some locations than others? So of course we have uh, attendees from all over the country. Perhaps that might be a, a relevant question. And what can be done realistically to improve and, and move uh, the needle with respect to uh, the, the mindset about the management of water? So, so perhaps um, if someone could, could speak to the level of risk and, and how uniform it is throughout the country, and, and, and is it actually heterogeneous from, from one part of Malaysia to the other? And, and of course, including our, our, our brothers and sisters over, over in Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, would, would someone be able to take that question? Yeah, perhaps Dr. Lim would be our expert in that area. And I'll, I'll take the second half of the question. Thank you. Wonderful, that. wonderful. That's okay. The small land mass itself, uh, I think uh, there is what we call the variations in terms of the uh, spatial as well as temporal as well. Uh, and mm -hmm. for instance, I think uh, uh, smaller states like uh, Malacca, Pulau Penang, perhaps even Perlis, and obviously Plain Valley itself, all right, because of the uh, at times we do incur actually what we call the water stress. And from the rainfall point of view, suddenly I think the small, smaller state does receive less rainfall to a certain extent, right? Especially those on the West Coast. And uh, obviously, I think when we talk about water stress, sometimes it's not just the rainfall, so the population in the deep, nah, that carries the thing, all right? Sapa and Sarawak is really just rich in water, not, not so much in water stress, but obviously we have pollution problem, right? So more, more in terms of quantity, and that's more in terms of quantity. So these are the few things that water. Uh, there's variations then in even small countries like us. Uh, and obviously during the monsoon time, more more water. But however, we do occur, uh, we do in, in a way the experience what we call hydrological drought. That can occur probably once in every five to seven years. Uh, once a while, you might have probably to, uh, for a short period, almost a month without rain since it does occur once in every five years. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Over to you, Renuka. Yes, yeah. in terms of changing mindset. So when I spoke about uh, Sungai Wei and working with the local communities uh, who live around the river, they were treating the river as a dumpster because that's mm. that's all that they were aware of. They were not aware that you know ninety seven percent of drinking water is actually coming from rivers. So it's creating that awareness for the local community. We actually took them up to the source of the river in Mount Kiara for them to see and, and, and really understand the water is coming out of the source in pristine quality. By the time it gets down to their backyard, it's uh, the color of yeah, mm -hmm. a nice dark coffee. Yeah. So with that awareness, then we started giving them um, uh, tools to help them understand, to help them change their behavior. 
So one of the ways was uh, recycling rubbish, recycling cooking oil. Uh, they then started finding ways that they could generate a little bit of income, you know, like the used cooking oil was turned into candles, which they then sold and it became a little business. So it became lucrative to stop throwing rubbish into the river and dealing with it in other ways. Yeah. So um, to your point, to your question, um, two things really, it's creating the awareness amongst people, amongst businesses, and then making them realize that there are alternative ways of dealing with the rubbish and perhaps even um, ways which are financial, financially attractive. Yeah, thank you so much, Renuka. That, that actually covered the Sri Tharan's question uh, on the education part of uh, uh, the, the surrounding population on, on Sungai Wei. But we did also have two other questions, uh, one from Mina, uh, Mina uh, Lakshana Ramadas, and one from Benny Yong. Uh, the one from Mina is basically, <laughs> how much have you spent, Heineken, in total to rehabilitate uh, Sungai Wei? And the second one may, may or may not, uh, you may want to pass to someone else, but it's, it's uh, perhaps uh, how your company ensures water security. This, this may be more a question to something like uh, your reserve margin that, that you have. So you might want to pass it to somebody else. But would you able to answer how much you've, you've spent as a corporation to rehabilitate the river? Yeah, sure, Gary. So as I mentioned, it's been a long journey since 2007 um, and investments made year on year. So to date, on all the water stewardship initiatives, we've spent 14 million, but particularly on Sungai Wei, the investment has been close to 3 million. And we continue to work with the local communities to maintain the river. So every year, 30 to 50,000 is spent on maintaining infrastructure, um, helping to pay for rubbish to be towed away, things like that. Yeah, so substantial investments. Yeah. yeah. In terms of security, Salima, would you want to take that? Uh, and talk about our effluent treatment plan. Uh, first of all, we have uh, water. Uh, so, yeah, we have some storage tanks uh, for water. We can, uh, yeah, uh, we store water, fresh water for, uh, yeah, for any purpose, and we can run the brewery, uh, uh, yeah, two days uh, to, uh, if you have any water disruption. Uh, at the same time, we have procedures in place. If you have some. Uh, disruption. We know exactly which uh, who is the biggest consumer within the brewery, and we stop that biggest consumers. And we are running some essential uh, operations. Um, yeah, uh, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, the other um, uh, security um, approach is uh, to keep uh, water tanks uh, for uh, recycled water. We have uh, plenty of recycled um, opportunities uh, uh, internally. Uh, so based on our technology. And uh, we, um, there was uh, even some examples in the chat box I saw. Uh, we also collect back our condensate water, for example. Um, uh, uh, so water from the pasteurization process. Yeah. And we use it for, um, for floor cleaning. Uh, so we cannot use it for gardening. Yeah. Uh, but for mm -hmm. floor cleaning, we can use it. So that is our approach to secure some uh, water in a brewery. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Salima. Um, I have a question. Well, two related questions, one from Andrea Lam, one from uh, Mr. Lim Chin. They're both uh, related to uh, specific businesses. Uh, Mr. Lim asks, how can I find out if our plant is located in a water-stressed area in Malaysia? And Andrea would like to know if there are any tools that can help them calculate how much water um, uh, that they as a corporation have discharged to the river uh, compared to how much uh, water is actually withdrawn from the river. Now, I'm not, not sure if they mean withdrawn uh, as a corporation or withdrawing or uh, whether it's um, uh, uh, what is, is being taken in from, from the water treatment plants. Uh, but uh, would anyone uh, be able to answer the question on uh, either the uh, location uh, of, of uh, your business or uh, any tools that are available? Perhaps uh, the, the second can be handled by handled by Dato Lim, uh, or, or maybe both. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, that's 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 how I see it. Because uh, normally in Heineken, we actually have water specialist uh, team. Okay. It goes around mm -hmm. every time we talk about investment on a new brewery. So they will ask all the right questions. And I think Dato Lim, uh, you probably <laughs> can shed some light. I think that's a very nice question. I think uh, as a, both as a resident, it's also, I think, uh, industrialist uh, in, in our 
first and foremost must know where the water come from and finally where the water get out get out to say, finally all right so in short where is the actually what coming from which treatment plant all right supply from which treatment plant and the treatment plant the water from which for which reason and in case from which river base thing that we're talking about, say, then you can appreciate the value of water. And for that, I think uh, one thing to check out is very simple. For those who stay in West Papua, all right, just check with the local uh, so called uh, water company. Like Slango, I Slango in Johor, we are ranking here with the water, for instance, all right, the relevant water company, just check with them. Now I'm this location. We'll give your give a, uh, the locations in terms of the detail and non detail, and then we'll tell you exactly your pipe water. From which reservoir, all right, and from that reservoir, go one step further. Where is actually water taking from which rivers? So I think have you, but all right, measuring water discharge from as I say, I think coming in definitely from water view, you know, but going out perhaps I think it's a bit more difficult because finally it's what it all does actually goes out through the what we call either through the uh the the, the kitchen, all right, or through perhaps from your factory or through your uh, all this also uh, quite different measure, but finally it will be uh, more true to your, I call it the effluent discharge. Yeah? The effluent discharge from the drain, the, the small drain that come up, you want it probably you can just put a small installation, all right, in terms of, a, we call it the current meter to measure roughly, roughly how much water is actually coming up on the, the so normal time as well as the peak time, uh, from there you can take the average itself, all right. Uh, so the toilet of probably say, I think you can just assume that whatever you use from the tap water finally you have to, you have to return back to the to the to the we call it the cell, all right, from the wastewater. But from whatever you come out from the effluent treatment from the factory, you can do a small installation by having a what you call a current meter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, just a time check. We, we are running down to the last few minutes uh, of this session today, but I would like to try to squeeze in a couple of more questions. We have a question from Julie. How do you reach out to rural residents, this is rural residents, huh? and authorities? And I think this is a very important uh, stakeholder on water harvesting and conservation uh, to, to make a real impact rather than, than to just give this, this issue, uh, as she says, a lip service. And then another question uh, from Muhammad Noor uh, Yazid, how uh, do we overcome urban development, uh, which can be one of the contributors to uh, water problems or water issues? Uh, would anyone like to take uh, one or both of those questions? Uh, Gary, in terms of the first question, reaching out to local communities. Thanks, yeah. So um, we have reached out to communities which um, have very source, a very um, limited source of water supply. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, in Sabah, we establish rainwater harvesting systems um, and gravity water systems. So communities who had to walk, you know, maybe five kilometers to just get their buckets of water for usage for the day. Um, so it's really heartwarming to see the difference that we could make uh, in their lives. And uh, how we went about it was working with NGOs to identify um, not just the communities, but also the systems, the right kind of systems that could support them. And the nice thing about this is with one of the communities, we were also able to, to work to establish a community garden. So the water was not just for um, their daily um, washing needs, but also for the community garden to survive. So then you are, you are creating an ecosystem where you are really supporting the local community. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Renuka. Um, anyone else would like to, to take the other question? Yeah, I will also add that actually that it's quite true that for those remote areas, especially the, where the houses are very sparse away, and more so in the uh, quite, uh, uh, not really, really jungle, but uh, mm. uh, here. Uh, to a certain extent, I think that uh, in terms of the water supply, uh, portable water, the pipeline might not be reached in that, that kind of area. But I think the Ministry of Health does, does carry out some form of so-called water, uh, portable water, uh, so-called we call it the on-site uh, water supplies. Mm -hmm. But uh, area where totally missed out by both uh, our relevant authorities, both uh, water, water supply authorities, uh, agencies, as well as the Ministry of Health. Uh, that's why I think the NGOs like us will come in and say to help them uh, to, and even corporate sector uh, like Hennigan, for instance, have been actually supporting giving a uh, portable uh, so-called water treatment plants so, uh, drawing water from whatever streams is available. Uh. So I think that can actually be in a way that work out. But obviously, 
I would say that uh, how how do they uh, get in contact first? Obviously, I think they can uh, actually check uh, with us, my like NGO. Uh, we, we can then uh, refer them to the relevant authority or uh, not relevant the corporate sector with assist in this manner. All right, where what water is not supplied to the so-called uh, government uh, agencies. Uh, right. Thank you so much, Dato. And and uh, we even though we do have questions, uh, this is a very very interesting and very hot topic. I'm afraid though that that we run out of time. Uh, for for this, we rest assured that we we have copied down all your questions, and uh, if, if we can reach you at all, we'll try to, to provide answers to your questions. In, indeed, some uh, participants have even um, offered some resources in the chat box uh, re with tools for for assessing uh, perhaps uh, the level of of um, uh, water risk in in your particular area. Uh, we encourage you to to look at those, uh, but uh, I do need to to uh, uh, end this re regrettably very much so. And I would like to to thank uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Roland for for uh, and Heineken uh, for uh, agreeing to participate and and to share their experiences. Also, big thanks to Renuka and Salima and, and Dato Lim as well. Uh, there is also a, a big crew at CGM. I'd like to thank them for their participation. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon uh, for this uh, series, for, for this installment of the series. Now, there is uh, a renewable energy session, just to remind you, uh, next week, exactly the same time, same place, and we will have with us um, Mr. Davis Chong of the Malaysian Photovoltaic Association, uh, who will be the facilitator and, uh, and present at that session. So with that, once again, a very big thanks to everyone involved. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to be able to moderate this, this session. Uh, and uh, I I'll look forward to seeing everyone again. And I, I believe you will have Ku Su Chuan back as, as moderator in the next session. Thank you so very much. Have a very uh, pleasant Wednesday. And uh, we'll see you around. Happy, happy saving water. Thank you. Right.